morning, church. Our reading this morning is taken from Luke chapter 2, verses 1 to 21. That's Luke chapter 2, verses 1 to 21. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinus was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven on earth, and peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angel had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in a manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what they had been told about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise the child, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he was conceived. Hear the word of the Lord. I wonder how you are this morning. I wonder what's on your mind. I wonder what is going on in your heart this morning, here and now. If I say the word love, I wonder what it is that you think and what it is that you feel. I wonder if joy is something that you experience. I wonder if you have hope. I wonder if you are content. I wonder if you know who you are in light of what God has done for you. I almost did the Mufasa voice. Remember who you are. But I didn't. But I could have. I wonder if you have gratitude. I wonder if you flash through your week. And you just think of all the conversations you had. You think of all the messages you sent. You think of all the posts you posted. Will these things be visible in your life? Will your life be a life that is known for these things? Are these things what is going on in your mind and what is going on in your heart? Now, to be honest, I don't know where you are at this morning. But I have great news for you today. That's also the name of our new series. You saw the slide. Our series title is That's Great News. What's it all about? Well, we want people to experience a gospel renewal. We want people to both individually and corporately as a church experience a renewal from this good news. We are trusting God that He will use this series for His renewal purposes. 
As a church, we say that we are gospel-centered. Let me just show you the slide again. We see the slide every single week. And we say being gospel-centered means living a life that is centered and saturated on, and then it goes, around the truth of the perfect birth, life, death, resurrection. That is a spelling mistake. We'll fix it in this week. Ascension and return of Jesus Christ, affirming Him as Lord and Savior. We remain rooted in the gospel. We live lives that is all about this. Whatever our current circumstances might be. Well, let me give you the shortest possible conclusion of this little paragraph. Christ is enough to sustain us through the valleys and hardships of life. Christ is enough to refresh and revitalize us in hard seasons of disorientation. Let me say it in plain Pretoria vernacular. People are pop. You guys know that, uh, that expression? Hey, brah, I feel pop. Don't come home and be pop. People are pop. We're struggling. But the gospel is not. So, let this truth of this series renew and revive us. May it revive our hearts and our minds and our lives. And may we truly experience a sense of renewal. This series is definitely positioned also to be an open and welcoming and loving space for people who do not believe in Jesus. Or people who might be seeking and wondering what our faith is all about. Because I mean the totality of our faith is covered in this little paragraph that we read every week. So if you know of someone who might benefit from what is the basics of Christianity, this series is definitely positioned for those people as well. It's an easy series. Each week we will cover one of these historical markers of the perfect life of Jesus. And this week it is the perfect birth. So Rudolf, if you can just show us that, there we are. The perfect birth as it is described to us in Luke 2 verses 1 to 21. You guys excited? I'm excited about this series. Now, why is the birth of Jesus great news? Four points. Firstly, God's providence is great news. Christ's incarnation, that means becoming human, going from one form into another form. Christ's incarnation is great news. The word of the angel, the words of the angel are great news. And the witness of the shepherds is also great news. Let me pray for us and then we'll jump right in. Lord Jesus, as we look at your birth today, we ask your Holy Spirit to amplify the truth and the implications of this for us right here and now. It is a story that we've heard so many times and we want to be in awe again of this beautiful story. We want this truth to transform us today, and not only to transform us, but to be really great news. For we don't want to leave pup today. We want to leave revitalized and refreshed by your word. And we pray that it would be this way. In your name. Amen. So let me just give you a frame quickly for the whole story. Two uh, uh, screenshots that I took from a Bible project poster. I think this is important, right? We always have to start with some form of frame. So our scripture reading comes from the book of Luke. And you'll see that the book of Luke and Acts is one unified story. You'll see top left, it was written by a guy named Luke. You'll see in the middle, he says in this book why he wrote it and how he wrote it. And you'll also see to the right of, this, uh, of the slide, he wrote this book to show how the story of Jesus, beginning with his birth, fulfills the story of God and Israel and the whole world. Okay? There you go. That's the purpose of this book. That's the preface before you start, or the introduction. Second slide, please, Rudolf. And then in the beginning part of this book, which is chapters 1 and 2, we see an introduction. Okay? An introduction to all the main characters in the book. It's always like that with any series as well. Like episode one sets up the story and then the story continues. So what you'll see, what's cool about Luke and the design of Luke, and I'm just showing it to you because you might not know it, is there's a parallel in Luke 1 and 2. So a parallel of John 
and a parallel of Jesus. John came first and he prepared the way for Jesus. Who was John? Well, he was the prophetic messenger who prepared Israel to meet their God. And who's Jesus? Well, it's clear to us, and we'll uh, uh, explain this a bit more, that he's the messianic king who will bring God's reign and God's blessing. So we see Zechariah, John's dad, sing a song of praise. We, sing Ma we see Mary, the mother of Jesus, sing a song of praise. And we also see that both Mary and Zechariah was visited by angelic beings, telling them that what it is that you guys waited for is here now. Like hot off the press. They didn't hear it via rumor or someone who said it to them. It was an angel who said it to them. And an angel actually means messenger. So angels through the Bible carry God's message. So everything that we saw now is great news. And we'll see as we read the story that it is great news first for those who knew about it and who waited for it. And then as the story of Luke continues, we'll see that it's great news for those who saw it and then heard the invitation to become part of it. It's a great story. Let's look at the first point. God's providence is great news. So look at verses 1 to 5. Rudolf, if you can put the scripture reading on for us as I work through the verses, I'll be glad, please. And then um, I'll ask you to go to some of the images once we need them. So let's just look at verse 1 to 5 quickly. We read about Caesar. Caesar Augustus is his name. He was also referred to as Octavian. Now what you guys need to know about Caesar back in the day is people referred to Caesar as God, or at least as a son of God, or a king, but not only like an administrative geographical king, a king that could rule and reign over all other kings. He was 100% most definitely the most important person in the known world at that point. Okay, Like his face was printed on money and on posters, and his name was almost experienced like the hyenas in Lion King experienced Mufasa, right? So this is the Caesar who Luke writes about. And what I love about Luke is Luke goes, listen, sir, there was this Caesar, but then there was also this someone else, right? So from the beginning, um, Luke tells us that someone better has just arrived. And people were longing for this. Why? Because the rule of the Romans was an oppressive rule. So even though these were the things that people said about Caesar, no one liked him because he ruled by brute force and violence and oppression. It was an unbelievably hard world. And in this time, God provides. God provides the one who they have wanted and who they have waited for. Now there's a problem here. Why? Because the Savior has to be born in Bethlehem. And at the moment, the Savior is in his mom's stomach in Nazareth. So how is God going to sort that one out, right? So in the time of Caesar, God provides. And then also, am I maybe talking a little bit too loud today? Can you guys hear me? Okay, great. So there's a problem here. And what needs to happen, Rudolf, if you can just show me the map quickly, please. Oops. So, this is the northern part of Israel. Israel had three parts, Judea, Samaria, and Galilee. Jesus, uh, Jesus' mom and dad is in Galilee at the moment. And they have to come all the way down this little dotted line to pass Jerusalem to go to Bethlehem. Okay? No third trimester pregnant woman would do this. Okay? It's 150 kilometers by foot or by donkey. And even if you were to take a donkey, I think he would give you a fair share of... <laughs> because it's far, and it's hot. So they have to travel at least four to seven days. Guys, I'm a dad of toddlers, right? I make animal noises. You guys should know that by now. So now God uses Caesar. He uses his pride. He uses his hubris. And he uses his senses, of all things. I mean, look at Verses. Verse 1, a decree about a census. Like, that's what catalyzes the birth of the Savior. Just think about that. So even though Caesar is not God, but he thinks he is, God's provision uses Caesar to achieve his purposes. Question, 
are you trusting for God's provision today? Because if you do, I've got good news for you, and that is He does provide. This story makes it clear. Are you wondering how God might be working in your life? Well, He can work with whatever circumstances you might be in. That's the joy of a story like this. I mean, third, third trimester pregnant woman up north in a country, right, covered in shame because she's pregnant out of wedlock. The Caesar that thinks he's God, and God goes, ooh, there's an opportunity here. Like human eyes can't see it, but God does. And we see God's provision. So that's great news in the story for us. Let's look at the second point. Christ's incarnation is great news, right? The fact that Jesus became a human being. Verses 6 to 7. The way that God comes into the world is so human and so humble and so significant. It's such a quiet start. I mean, think about it. The Savior of the world. Like a baby crying in a manger. <laughs> That's how it starts. It's so humble. It's so down, 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 down. But the reason why it's down, 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 and to quote C.S. Lewis, is because God starts there and then brings back up, 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 everything that was broken. Like God starts in a really quiet and unimportant place. And he lifts the whole world from that point. Martin Luther, the great reformer, said, No other God do I have but thee, born in a manger, died on a tree. That's the God we serve. Very human and very humble. Let me show you a picture. So this is a screenshot taken from a video of the Bible Project. All the YouTube professionals would see that later. My screenshots also exhibit the word play in the bottom left corner. My bad. But just look at this. Look at this. Really quiet. Really simple. Really obscure, like, who are these folk? Who came all this way to check out what's going on in here while everyone else is sleeping. But the sky is lit up with stars and it'll soon be lit up with angels with phenomenal news. The way God comes to the earth tells us something about His character. He showed us the way to live by starting humble, he showed the Father to us by starting humble and living humble. And therefore, we can know Him. Think about it, guys. He came. He said He was going to come. And He did. He entered into this world from a different world, from God's space. He came into human space so that He knows God knows what it's like to be a human being. That makes the Christian God and Jesus Christ, who's God in the flesh, the most compelling God, I believe, or Lord, that you can serve. Because He knows what it's like to cry. He knows what it's like to be glad. He knows what it's like to have friends. He knows what it's like to be rejected. He knows what it's like to feel alone. He knows what it's like to have wedding celebrations. Hey? Eh? Like he knows what it's like to be a human being. He knows you. And he pitched his tent among us because he wants us to see him. He wants us to know that he didn't leave us to our own devices and that he will keep his promises. Where else did God do this? He did this in the wilderness with the Israelites. God said, I'm going to save you from here and I'm going to take you there. And just in case you are wondering, I am going to be with you through this whole journey. I shall live in my tent among you so that you can see me, so that you don't have to doubt in my promises, so that you don't have to wonder if I care for you. I'm coming among you. And once again, God did it in Jesus, right? He showed his willingness to get into the most dirty of places. By starting in a feeding trough, guys. When was the last time you went to a feeding trough and went, Ha, ah, let me just get a whiff of everything that's going on in here. It is a stinky place. 
It is a smelly place. And remember, animals don't go to the bathroom. They just use the bathroom wherever they are. It is a stinky joint, this. And that's where God starts. Because I will go to stinky joints and show that nowhere can, uh, can people escape my presence and my saving power. I'm with you no matter what. Maybe we have some difficulty accepting this miraculous thing that God did because we have gotten so clever at strategy and planning and influence. Think about this, guys, okay? Let's do a little experiment. If I said to you this morning, okay, guys, Project Savior, I want to go viral so that the majority of the world will know my name. I would like about 25% buy-in and following, right? So if I send out the message, I would like about a quarter of the people to say, follow, I'm in. I would like my teaching to be forwarded, right, to most people on earth. And I want people to adopt my ethos and values at least to 66% of the known world. How do you guys think we'll do it? Well, let's be honest. We've gotten so clever. We would never imagine that living in obscurity, being born in a manger, staying in rural areas, never going into politics, and actually dying the moment you gain some public traction is the plan. But that was God's master plan. That's how he got us here today. He started there. And he did what he thought was wise. And by that he changed the world. God's wisdom is remarkable. Listen to the Apostle Paul in Romans. Romans 11, verses 33 to 36. He speaks about salvation. And he says, Oh, the depths of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and untraceable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? And who has ever given to God that he should be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. The way that Jesus comes to this world is great news for us. It's God's master plan. It's a crazy plan, but it's a brilliant plan. Because he achieved his purposes through the end. Let's look at the third point. The words of the angel, the words of the angel are also great news. Why? Because they answer a very important set of questions. And the biggest question is, who's this kid? Right? And why is this birth significant? I mean, think about it. If we only read verses 1 to 7 today, and you've never read any other portion of the Bible, you might think that this is a really, really strange story. Because it's a story about a census and people being counted and a kid being born, right? Pretty sure that many other kids were also born on the road during the census. Like, why is this a big deal? And the angel comes from verse 8 to verse 14 and he explains why this is a big deal. And verse 11 is the key. Look at it with me. Rudolf, if we can have verse 11 up, please. I'll be really glad. Look at verse 11. Today... In the city of David, a Savior was born for you, who is the Messiah, the Lord. That's why this story is an important story. He's Christ. Christ means King. It means the promised one. The one you've been waiting for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That one was born here today. So it's not just any kid. Second thing, he's Lord. That means he's divine. That means he's different than humanity. He's other. Who else is called the Lord in the Old Testament? Well, God. Do you guys remember during our series we did I Am Who I Am? I took one Sunday teaching and I just explained where the God Yahweh, oh, sorry, where the name Yahweh comes from, which is God's name. We translate it into English as Lord. Now the angel says, that's the one who was born, right? God himself. And then the third thing he says is he's a savior. He is the one you need. Now, for a savior being born to be good news for you, 
you have to believe the bad news first. And the bad news is the truth of your own sin and the terrible state of your heart. Think about this, my dear brothers and sisters. You know what it's like to struggle. You do. You know what it's like to be in bondage to sin, to feel tied down. To do the same thing again and again and again, knowing that it breaks God's heart. Hoping that you'll achieve a different end, but you don't. You know what it's like to be stuck. And when you are humble enough to admit this, that's when the birth of Jesus is great news. That's when it's great news to know that a Savior was born to you. Let me use a really simple but a profound example. Think of the odorant. If someone brings me a gift, good news, dude, here is some deodorant for you, okay? Dove, clean comfort, antiperspirant, 48 hours of protection. I am only going to experience that deodorant as great news if I am humble enough to admit that I suffer from body odors. Do you guys see? So if I know that I am smelly, and if I am willing to admit that I am smelly, then someone bringing me some deodorant is great news. Because then I'll go, cheers, ta, I really need this. I remember as a young boy, I started uh, putting deodorant on, and my dad was like, dude, wow, that's the whole can. And I was like, dad, have you ever seen the commercials on the telly? Like that guy lifts his hand, he's got a perfectly ripped muscle arm, and then he sprays like from his wrists, all the way down, all the way up with this cloud of the other about that goes, yeah dude, that's only in the, uh, in the advertisements, right? Just point it, and you'll be fine. But point is, if you're humble enough to admit and believe the bad news of your sin, then this is great. It is great news to know that the person who was born here is the one who will save me from this. I don't have to suffer from the stuckness and bondage and struggle anymore. Someone will bring me out of it. And that's why God sent His Son. And that's why He's called, in verse 11, a Savior. Think about this. God didn't send us an economist. Because the problem of this world is not economy. God didn't send us a philosopher because the problem of this world isn't found in lofty philosophical ideas. God, sin, God didn't send us an entertainer because the problem of this world is not that we don't have enough entertainment. God did not send us a politician because the problems of this world isn't politics. God didn't send us an administrator because the problem of this world won't be solved if we just organize our stuff better. God sended us, sended, God sent us a savior. Because the problem of this world is sin. And we need to know our need. And when we know our need for a savior to pull us out of this life of sin, then this is great news. And I want to remind you, even if it's not for you this morning, you know someone who can be described as struggling in bondage and stuck. The best news we can give to anyone who's found in that place is that there's a way out of it. And that way out is taking a leap of faith and trusting in this child who was born in this stinky feeding trough because he's the savior of the world. It's good news. It's good news. And watch this now as we transition to the last point. He says all of these things first to the shepherds. What? Think of our plan earlier. If we want to go viral, are we going to ask people who have no followers on the socials to post and repost this, right? Like they've got no numbers. They've got no following. They are insignificant, marginalized people. But God chooses to appear to them first. And he gives them this witness. So last point. The witness of the shepherds is great news. God doesn't hold a press conference. He doesn't uh, uh, send the story to some big time journalists. 
He's definitely not trending on social media of the day. No, 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 no. If good news comes, then good news needs to reach the people first who need it most. And this insignificant, marginalized group of people known as shepherds, if you guys remember that I called up the stinky nature of animals earlier, like that's how they smelled, that's where they lived, that's what they did. They were never clean or pure or ready to go for temple worship. They looked after animals. God chooses to share the good news with them first. Why? Because they represent those who He came for. God came for the lowly. God came for the oppressed. God came for those who really needed good news. And what do they say? Look at verse uh, 15. Let's go. Let's go check it out. Because it's good news. That's where the question of the day comes from, just by the way. Like, what's the coolest place you've been to? For the shepherds, they're like, yes, more animals and a baby. Let's go check it out. I'm glad, though, that they did decide to check it out. That's a good posture to have if someone shares good news with you. I think sometimes in this world we live in, people dismiss Christianity and they never even came to check us out. I'm like, dude, what's that all about? Be like the shepherds, man. Like, at least come and see what it's all about. Come and experience it for yourself. And they did. And you guys know what they found? They found a kid swaddled in cloths in a feeding trough. For us that sounds weird. For them it's a symbol. Let me tell you why. These shepherds worked in Bethlehem, right? We are in Bethlehem at the moment. They were shepherds who were commissioned to make sure Every year at the day of, uh, uh, during the feast of, uh, of the Passover, that there would be enough lambs to be sacrificed by all God's people so that they can celebrate Passover. Now, what kind of lamb did they need to celebrate Passover? They needed a lamb who was perfect. So these guys were commissioned to make sure that little lambs don't get hurt before they have to go for sacrifice. Do you guys know how they made sure that these lambs would be perfect? They picked them up and they swaddled them in very specific priestly cloths and they put them in the feeding trough so that none of the other animals would step on them. So these shepherds, every single year, they were like, perfect for sacrifice, perfect for sacrifice. Perfect for sacrifice, swaddled, swaddled, left it in there. For what kind of sacrifice? So that their blood could flow, so that God's people's sins would be covered. One lamb per family. And the shepherds, they run to the manger, they ask what all of this is about, and they see a child in swaddling cloths, in a feeding trough. Perfect for what? For atonement. Perfect to cover for their sin. They knew immediately what was going on here. Guys, isn't that just awesome? That's why God chooses to show it to them in this way. And now they know that this is good news for everyone. And as we read the rest of the scriptures, uh, Rudolf, you can just show us 17 to 21, please. We see that the shepherds returned. They were glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had seen and heard, which, they, uh, which were just as they had been told. It changes everything for this group of people. They tell the story. They give God praise. They believe it. Why? Because they saw it. Salvation is about knowing a person. And that person is named Jesus Christ. And that person came through a perfect birth. How awesome is the story of Jesus' birth? Let me show you two last images, and then I will land the plane for us. Because these are two images that just, uh, um, I think, explain why this is good news. So, Bethlehem. You guys will see that this is uh, the place where we were in the earlier image. It's just a little bit more blurred now. 
And the focus is on who? Who's that? That's Caesar Augustus. That's the Roman ruler. That's Octavian. A world that is ruled by a human or an earthly king just changed by the birth of this child. Rudolf, if you can show us the last one, please. Look at that. Did you guys see it? Ach, Rudolf, do it again. Do it again. Look, look. A dark world with an earthly ruler, not God changing by the birth of this child to bring life and to rule this world. A child in swaddling cloths, in a manger, the perfect birth. And that's great news. Why? Because it shows God's providence. It shows us how He became a human, which reminds us that He knows what we go through. The words of the angel are great news. Why? Because he said a Savior is born and a Savior is what we need. And the witness of the shepherds is great news for us because it shows that the birth of this child is for all people. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we long for this world to be ruled by this baby in swaddling cloths. And we thank you that his rule started by this perfect birth. We want to submit under this child, born in such a quiet place in such humble circumstances. And through that rule, we want to be saved. We want to be made new. We want to be transformed. We want to be like the shepherds and respond with joyous, joyous exclamations of praise. May your birth be good news to us today. And may we share this as good news for everyone who is hurting and stuck in trouble and in bondage. May we tell them about this baby. The Messiah, the Lord, the Savior born for all of us in the city of David. May your name be glorified through our testimony as your name is glorified through the testimony of the shepherds. Amen. Amen.